When I was 13 in Liberia, we went through a military coup that was quite traumatic for me as a child. And um, some of our friends' parents were executed. It was, we, we had to leave, you know, suddenly. And I came back to the U.S. at that time in eighth grade, which is a tender period of life, you know? And I remember making a vow. I didn't know it was called an inner vow at the time that I will never live someplace that is not safe. Hi guys, welcome back to Raw Mission, the podcast where we bring you challenging and inspiring stories of ordinary folks sharing the good news of our extraordinary God in some of the toughest parts of the world. I'm Matt, your host, and today I've got Cynthia Anderson with me. Cynthia is a YWAM missionary, speaker, a trainer, and author of a brand new book called The Multiplier's Mindset, which tackles some of the main paradigm shifts we need to go through if we're to catalyze disciple-making movements. Cynthia spent decades pioneer church planting in Nepal and India, where after years of frustration and self-doubt, she saw hundreds of new believers and many movements to Christ emerge. Hi, Cynthia. So good to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be here. I love what you guys are doing. So really honored to be able to talk with you today. Thanks. Cynthia's a a guest. Uh, She's never worked with Frontiers, but we have some good friends in common from my days in northern Pakistan. And I'm really excited to talk to her today, not only to hear about all her different years serving overseas in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and growing up in West Africa, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get into that in a minute. But more than that, Cynthia's just released this week a book called The Multiplier's Mindset. And it's all about making disciples and movements of disciple making. So that's something that's close to our hearts uh, here in Frontiers uh, in all the different forms that that takes. And we're really looking forward to hearing some of the wisdom that Cynthia's gleaned over the years. So yes, Cynthia, tell us about your childhood. Where did you grow up? Well, I am a missionary kid. I grew up in West Africa. I was born in the country of Nigeria in the midst of a civil war, actually. Mm. So um, some crazy stories of missions that my parents did back then, crossing a burning bridge to get to the airplane to fly up to northern Nigeria where I was born. But born in the midst of a a conflict in Nigeria. And then uh, we left when I was a year old. And my dad stayed back and served in the relief efforts there. Um, But then we returned to Africa and I lived in Ghana and Liberia as a child. So yeah, Mm -hmm. some raw mission that was happening in my childhood. We used to say our friends in America got snow days (laughs) when it would snow, but we got coup days when we would have coups and get out of school. Oh my gosh. (laughs) You have memories of, I don't know, snakes and scorpions or mosquitoes or it's very normal, I suppose, when you grow up there. But what what would be some of your, your... fond or crazy memories? Yeah, well, I have many fond memories. I had a great childhood um, living in West Africa. And of course, I have some hard memories as well with the evacuations and coups and things too. But some of my fun memories are when I was a child in Ghana, my father decided that every birthday he would buy me a new pet. And so I, I had a parrot, I had a monkey, I had a pangolin, which is kind of like an anteater. I had all kinds of basically my own little home zoo. And I just loved it. I love being able to go outside and play with all these different animals and climb the trees and get stuck Mm. up in the tree because there was a snake that was blocking my way down or, you know, (laughs) lots of fun (laughs) stories as a kid. Yeah, that's cool. And how do you answer when somebody says, oh, isn't it such a disadvantage to grow up without, you know, the best healthcare or the best education, which is very (laughs) pejorative anyway, how do you define what's a good education? But what, you know, people in the West sometimes throw that around, like they know what the best kind of education is, but what would be your response in terms of that? I mean, did you homeschool or did you go to an international school? Yeah, well, as a kid myself, we lived in capital cities by the time I was school age. And so we did go to the American cooperative schools to an international school in Ghana, both Ghana and Liberia. 
Um, our kids, when we live later in Nepal, and we'll talk about that in a minute, we're homeschooled and then later boarded. So we've kind of had the whole range mm. of experiences with schooling. And we've definitely had that question, you know, don't you think that it'd be better for your kids? Um, wouldn't it have been better for you if you had grown up in a place that had all these advantages? And my answer is always this, um, Matt, just the best place you can possibly be is in the center of God's will. Mm. And if it's God's will for you to be in a difficult living situation that has conflicts and, you know, challenges physically, that is still the very best place you can be for God's blessing. And I certainly experienced that. I mean, there were hard times, but there was such a richness. I feel like I have a rich, rich heritage of relationships. I grew up knowing such a diversity of people and cultures and the worldview that I have is something that some people pay millions of dollars you know, to get or to travel, yes. you know, thousands of dollars at least to travel and give their kids an exposure for a week to Germany or somewhere, you know. And yeah. I grew up visiting so many countries. And um, yeah, I had a great childhood and mm. we were in the center of God's will. And that's what made all the difference. Yeah, that's good. It's the scripture doesn't say follow Jesus and get a good education in a particular format does it <laughs> no, and we sometimes think doesn't. that's oh it's just we have all these shoulds and expectations sometimes we don't realize we have them but it's good to hear yeah I'm I mean I think you you just learn so much out of a school setting don't you in in the real you do. world yeah you do. Wh wherever we live that's true um okay so then where were your parents from originally we haven't asked that question Sure. Yeah, my parents were from the United States, from Kansas, Lawrence and Topeka, Kansas. And they went to the mission field um, straight out of Bible college. Mm. And uh, they actually went on a ship. You know, people were still going by boat to get to wow, the mission cool. field. And so, yeah, I come from that kind of a heritage. But um, yeah. Did you That's always we feel from. that you would follow your parents into that kind of work, serving the Lord overseas in different cultures? And I suppose second question to that is, were they working with the established church or were they, you know, working with unreached groups? And, and what did you fall into when you started your missions work? Yeah, well, my... My father went to Fuller Seminary, and he did um, kind of in the time of, you know, C. Peter Wagner. He was there in that kind of era where uh, there was a lot of talk about unreached peoples. That was sort yeah. of the um, the first, yeah. you know, beginnings of it. So he he did have a passion for the unreached to work among the disadvantaged, least reached peoples from the beginning. Um yeah. And so I did pick up that from him um, on the mission. I went, you know, as a kid on the motorbike and we crossed the river and I'd be on the back of death's bike, you know, going to these villages and, you know, watching him share the gospel. So definitely I absorbed cool. some of that. But when I was 13 in Liberia, we went through a military coup that was quite traumatic for me as a child. And um, some of our friends' parents were executed. It was, oh, we God. we had to leave, you know, suddenly. And I came back to the U.S. at that time in eighth grade, which is a tender period of life, you know? Yes. And I remember making a vow. I didn't know it was called an inner vow at the time that I will never live someplace that is not safe. Wow. And um, so I was not intending to spend my life on the mission field, but I studied literature in college and but when I was in my second year of college, I decided to go on a mission trip. I kind of had a travel itch, you know, I hadn't traveled for a long time. Yeah. My motives weren't that great, to be honest, but I, I went on a mission trip to Thailand and Singapore. And for the first time with adult eyes, I saw the unreached mm. and I saw that there are seriously millions who have no idea who Jesus is. And God began to deeply work in my heart. And I knew that summer when I came back, I can't just live the American dream. I have to dedicate my life to making sure that everyone has an opportunity to hear and to experience the good news as I have. Mm, interesting. So how did that develop into you going off to Southeast Asia long term? Yeah, so we, um, my husband, who had been a college friend, we he had a similar experience to me the same summer, 
And uh, we both, you know, we got married, we youth pastored for a year in the U.S. And then uh, felt like God was leading us to, we knew we weren't called to youth pastoring in an American context. Our passion was for the unreached. And so uh, we had heard of Youth with a Mission or YWAM and um, there was a training coming up and we said, let's give it a try and get to know why I'm see what we, you know, what it's like. And, um, our hearts really aligned with the vision and, and, uh, culture and ethos of why we thought about frontiers too, but we weren't, you know, sure if that was the right for us and why was where we kind of fell into, but we've, we've loved frontiers and often partnered with frontier missionaries around yeah. the world. Yeah. Great. Uh, I have such fond memories of the YWAM guys in North Pakistan. We just hung out with them. I worked with them as well. So yeah, it's great. And uh, I mean, I know so many young people still today who do the discipleship training school, the DTS, as it's often known. Mm -hmm. It's usually mm -hmm. three months of teaching and three months of outreach, isn't it? In two different That's countries, right. usually. Um, yeah, yeah. Such a great foundation of, of just identity and discipleship and then putting it into practice in not in the classroom, but out on the streets. And we yeah, we love YWAM. We, we still connect really well with them. Um, I was over at the Send in Oslo last year and oh know, yeah yeah talk, yeah talking with the ywam guys now about you know what what about britain you know it could be yeah it could be the next one so yeah i just but i think for them in this age it's really about collaboration you mm. know we all need to put together whatever resources and gifts we have in our different organizations denominations and point them at the unreached the least yes. reached and see movements released among them so yeah, yeah it doesn't really matter who you're with. Let's just yeah, all exactly. go after the same yeah. goal. Good. Okay. Um, so you you came across YWAM and you were in the States at this point. Did you go and do your own DTS somewhere? We did. We did. Though we had gone through Bible college and, you know, already had a theological education. I already, you know, had a lot of missions experience as a kid. But in Youth with a Mission, it is the requirement of any long-term worker to go through a discipleship training school. And it really changed my life, though I knew a lot about God, the community and face-to-face -face disciple making that took place. It, it was really a good experience. And it was there when we had the teaching on hearing God's voice that God spoke to my husband and I about Nepal, which is where we first went. And um, yeah, we finished our discipleship training school DTS. And about six weeks later, we were in Nepal. Wow. That's awesome. What was your vision for Nepal? Were you in the in the cities of, of Kathmandu or Pokhara and, and supporting the local church? Or was there a YWAM base where you were trying to do more out in the regions of sort of up in the Himalayas? Yeah, well, the church had just come out from being underground in Nepal. We went there in 1991. Okay. Uh, the church had just, it, the church was underground and, and secret for many, many years, but there had just been a change where of democracy in the nation. And so we, we landed in Nepal at a very strategic point in history. And uh, we really recognize it as that. And uh, so, no, our vision was to plant a church among the unreached. Mm -hmm. um, we hadn't ever heard of disciple making movements or church planning movements. Those terms weren't even used back then, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to plant one church. And so we looked for an area um, that didn't have any churches, which wasn't hard to find in Nepal at that time. And there was a valley area about three hours outside of Kathmandu. We had to live in in the, the capital in order to get our visa mm. and uh, we were students there and studying Nepali um, but we would go every weekend and every holiday and stay in this village area about 10,000 people it took us three months to find anyone who had heard of Jesus there wow. um, but we found one man who became a person of peace and through him we were able to start a church that church started multiplying and today that valley area is more than 10% followers of Jesus. So no we really give God thanks for that. It oh, was, um, and we also had George Patterson. I don't know, are you familiar with George? Um, he's so. kind of one of the fathers of church multiplication in the modern era. And George and another leader um, came out and did a seminar probably after we'd been in Nepal about a year. 
and they shared the vision of multiplication. And that was the first time we ever thought about planting more than one church that, wow, we could plant a church that would plant churches. Yes. That would plant churches. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> new vision, new dream. And we yeah. embraced it. And really, we've been on that journey ever since then. Wow. That's good. It, it, I mean, in some ways, that reflects the history of our organization because when we started i mean i think people even even our mission statement said you know making disciples amongst muslims or something like that and and then after 10 years oh that's that's happening quite a lot so let's we better like oh no planting churches and now we've changed it to multiplying and making movements or catalyzing movements because right. god is god's at work and we need to think bigger. he can do so much more than we ask or imagine so yeah absolutely true go on then so what happened Next, did you did the church you'd planted catch the same vision and, and understand that it's not just sort of us, the one church adding, or was that something that in a new location you had to to try again? Yeah, no, the, the church that we started in Nepal, we were able to put that into the DNA of that church. And um, you know, we were we were just trying our best with whatever we knew, you know, and what Georgia taught us to apply these principles of multiplication. But one thing we did right i'd say or well was we we really created ownership of the vision within the people and we were in the shadows mm. so as you know fairly quickly we moved into the shadows and we just coached the leaders and they were the ones that were baptizing people they were the ones that were spreading the gospel and mm. we you know we came alongside them as coaches and partners and supporters, friends, encouragers, prayer warriors for them. And, um, and they did it and they, that started to spread and it wasn't long before they were going to nearby villages and starting other groups of disciples and churches. And mm -hmm. it began to spread that way. Isn't that so releasing in some ways, because I think sometimes when you go overseas, you think, oh, there's so much pressure on, on us to do lots of things and see it all happen. And, uh, in a sense, manage everything, but actually, yeah, it doesn't have to be like that. I love that phrase you just mentioned in the shadows. Yeah. We, we talk now about catalyzing movements rather than, you know, maybe planting, leading, establishing, and it, it's a good mindset that's come into missionary thinking, hasn't it? In the last maybe 10, 20 years where we're more ready to just be alongside us rather than mm. take control of everything. Yeah. And actually that's where you see more fruit. I know <laughs> yes. if our goal is to see people come to know Jesus, that is more effective when mm. we can be in the shadows and let them mm. own the vision and carry it in their own way and mm. be there, the ones that champion them. And they, you know, they, they're going to do it better than you do. <laughs> exactly. I was just going to say <laughs> you know? that they're always going to be better at language and culture and, and sharing the gospel in, in that way. So yeah. that's right. It actually it, it brings up one of the mindsets from the book. It, can I talk about that for Please. a second? Please, yeah, do. Yeah. yeah. So one of the mindsets um, from the book is discover. Don't bring the gospel to save the lost. Discover the gospel at work in the lost. And, you know, for us as young missionaries, field workers, that was that was a change that took place. You know, we mm. we heard God tell us to go to Nepal. We we went, you know, we went expecting our first baby with hardly any money, but we yes. went and we were gonna take the gospel to this unreached area. And when we got there, we found out, even though there were many who had never heard his name, as we started to talk to people, we discovered God was already there. <laughs> mm. Funny thing, right? Like yeah. God was already there ahead of us and he was working. And again, you talked about taking the pressure off when we partner with what God is doing in people's lives. And we, when we see our job as discovering what he's doing mm. in them and in that community, it, the pressure is so much less. And then God begins to work and things begin to happen because you're, you're watching for him in people's mm. lives rather than trying to cram something down somebody's throat, you know, yeah. that you brought in. Yeah. yeah I like that. Yeah. Really good. I, I remember one author talking about looking for Jesus in places where there are no churches. Um, mm. You know, where's Jesus at work or where are people hungry for Jesus or want to know more about this character they may mm. have heard of? OK, so how many years did you spend in Nepal and what was your role as the emerging movement grew, if you'd call it? Yeah. That? Yeah. So we um, we were in Nepal for 10 years. And as the movement began to grow, 
our role was less hands-on. You know, in the beginning, we were really discipling new believers. And um, and so as our role was shifting and they were more capable, we wanted to move away so that they would be really free to run with it. And so we shifted our role more to training other Nepalis to go to new areas. We started launching new teams of indigenous missionaries to go to new areas. Um, and yeah, almost all of the church planning teams that we trained and led, um, provided leadership for, I should say, um, went into new unreached areas. So that shifted our focus, became that, say, the last uh, five years that we were in Nepal. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, 25 indigenous teams that we raised up and trained and sent out into new areas. And again, it was at such a strategic time in the nation of Nepal. You know, people were had never heard of Jesus. So it was something new and there was a receptiveness and there wasn't a lot of opposition yet um, okay. in a way, you know, yeah. because there's this newness. And so things began to open up and spread really rapidly. And then our role was more coaching those team leaders and helping them uh, to be effective in what they were doing in these new areas. Mm. Just to clarify for some of our listeners who might be trying to picture this you know what does this look like so teams are going out are they building buildings and, and establishing a church like that or how did it start and how did it continue because from what i understand you know once you get church buildings and professional people it slows a movement right down it was that your experience in the sense that did you try a different model yeah well I would have to say that back then and it was in the 90s we were still learning some of the principles about disciple making movements and what really causes organic rapid growth. Um, and we, you know, a lot of that we were still learning, <laughs> I'd say mm -hmm. learning from trial and error and experiences. So some of our team members did build buildings. Um, I would say it did slow the growth in some of those situations so that a church was established, but it didn't multiply as rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they did start one or two daughter churches. Well, I think today we would have advised them, don't build a building, <laughs> you know, keep meeting in homes, multiply it faster. Don't yeah. gather a group that's more than eight or 10 people and multiply it. You know, we were still learning back then. So mm -hmm. um, actually in our later years as we shifted to India and um, some other mindset shifts that took place in us uh, catalyzed more movement type growth than what we saw. We saw good growth, we, but it, a lot of it was addition growth um, in those years in Nepal, other than in the movement that we started, which multiplied really rapidly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. How did the finances work? Were you guys conduits of money coming in from the States or were they able to get take their professions with them and, and as lay people plant churches or get little groups going yeah so again it was it was a combination of different things happening again in that season we were still exploring and learning lots of things but um, many of them would start little businesses raising goats or chickens, which actually was really good because it didn't only give them finance. It also gave them a role in the community, which was really vital. They couldn't just show up in a village and, you know, not have any kind of particular reason to answer. Why are you here? And so they would go and need something uh, to give them that platform, that reason mm. to explain what they did. So we would encourage these kinds of small businesses or maybe a tailor shop or, you know, different things like that. Um, most of them had that. Some of them were supported. Um, you know, it didn't take a lot of money to support somebody. So maybe they had met somebody somewhere, <laughs> gave them $20 a month, and that's what they lived off of, you know. Um, yeah. So there was a variety, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, for most of the Frontiers workers around the world, we have to do the same. We have to have a... A platform, a reason to be there that makes sense in the community, that uses our own gifts and professional skills. Um, yeah, just alongside that. For you guys in Nepal, were you able to be there on missionary visas? 
No, no, not at all. We try. We had lots of different types of visas. We were there yeah. mostly on student visas. I was on a dependent visa. My husband was on a student visa, and mm. um, he studied many different languages. <laughs> 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 he kept studying a new. He studied Tibetan. He studied Nepali. He studied Nawari, and you know, just uh, whatever yeah. we could do to obtain a visa um, was what we did. Later on, we started a small business and we were on a business visa and that that actually is what um ended we we lost our visa mm. uh and we were not able to obtain the visa that we had hoped to and so that was how god actually shifted us to india and mm. um yeah when we went to nepal we knew we were called like you are called to go to Nepal. And we we went with great joy and anticipation. When we shifted to India, it was not a fun move. We were fluent in Nepali. Our three children had been born there. We love Nepal. But suddenly we crossed the border because we had some friends across the border. It was in the middle of the massacre of the king of Nepal when the prince of Nepal killed the entire royal family and then shot himself. I don't know oh. if you remember hearing about that. No, news, I did not know about that. Gosh. It was a crazy situation. The whole country shut down right in the midst of that. Our visa expired. And so here we are, you know, having to shift to a new country. It was hard, to be honest. It was a really tough situation. Yeah. But in the midst of that, and, and I went into India hating India. Nepalis don't particularly like India. And I had picked that up, you know, mm. from being so identified with Nepali people. And so here we are in this country that I don't like. It's hot. It's humid. We're suddenly having to homeschool our kids. It was a really difficult situation. But one morning I woke up and I was just, you know, talking to God about it. And I was like, I am so not wanting to be here, God. I don't like India. I don't even like Indian people. And the Lord dropped in my heart. He said, Cynthia, are you willing to love what I love? And it was a hard, challenging question. And of course I said, Lord, I'm willing, but you have to give it to me because I don't have it in the natural. But if you will give me a love for India, I'm willing to love India. And he did. He answered that prayer and he dropped this deep love for India and Indian people. And I suddenly began to see how unreached they are, how much, you know, the, the Nepali church had and how little the Bengali church had, you know, yeah. around us and the massive, massive need of the people there. And God just opened my my eyes and my husband's eyes and really gave us a passion and heart. And then we actually stayed in that very same place where we had dropped after losing our visa in Nepal for 14 years, longer right. than we were in Nepal. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you can share both those experiences because, you know, young folks I talk to all the time, students here, they wrestle with this whole idea. What's calling? Yeah, how do I know? Mm. How do I know if I'm called this to this place? Is it only if I love it, or if it is it only if I hate it? It must be God's mm. will and God's calling. And <laughs> we get so confused, don't we, around this whole subject of God's leading sometimes? And yeah, I always answer by saying, "Gosh, calling means a hundred different things. God is so individual mm. and personal. Everyone has a different story." But it's interesting that yours covers both the, the place that you loved initially and just settled in quickly and and the one that was a struggle you know god can give us and does give us a love for the people he puts in front of us um mm -hmm. so whether yeah whether we end up there by choice or like jonah <laughs> you mm -hmm. know he, he is the god who can give us his compassion well he needs to really doesn't he because none of us have even if we like a country we can't touch on the compassion that god has so i think That's that right. has to be a constant prayer doesn't it lord give me mm -hmm your broken heart and your eyes for this place because mm. we can miss so much of what's broken around us. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I would encourage those who are listening to dare to pray that prayer. Lord, would you put your love in my heart for the people around me? Would you put a fresh love? Those who are maybe working in areas where the initial excitement wore off <laughs> and it does, you know, at first yeah. it can be so you have this honeymoon stage and then it's like, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? This is hard. And just to, to, to go to God and say, God, I need you to put your love in my heart because my love has run out Yeah, and he will. He's so faithful. 
Yeah, that's good. That's a good reminder. And and I think sometimes when we've worked on the field too for a few years, we can not just lose some of the compassion or lose the vision, but yeah, we have to sometimes come to a point where we say, Lord, I've tried everything. I've gone into culture and language as much as I can, and I'm not seeing fruit. Oh, I need your help here. It's always good to come back to that place of prayer, isn't it? And humility before God, mm. not just mm. rely on our own push on through type of yeah, effort. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So tell us about and- India. What did you learn there? Was it a very similar experience, fruit coming fairly quickly, or was it a tougher experience? Yeah, it was it was tougher, I would say. Um the I think the environment was a little harder, where we were at in life was a little harder. Mm. Um, we were cross-cultural missionaries twice, you know. <laughs> Once we went from America to Nepal, and then the second time we went from Nepal to India. So we went through culture shock again. We had to learn another language. Mm. Um, and so it was it was challenging and um yeah, there are there are some significant challenges in just doing life there. Um, we had to rebuild a new team, you know, lots of things that were involved there. And yeah, it it didn't come quickly there. Um, and we, you know, we were doing a lot of the same kinds of things, which is, you know, an example of how it's not really about what you do, but it's about God who yeah. is the one who sovereignly works through what you do matters, but it really is a move of God. And I remember one particular morning when I was, I was sitting out in my garden and I I talk about this story in the book, but I was sitting out in my garden. It was a beautiful, cool morning where we lived in India was a very hot place, but the morning was cool. And I was out there drinking my coffee, spending time with the Lord and tears just started streaming down my face. And I just was so overwhelmed with sadness. Lord, here we are sacrificing so much to be here. We're working hard every day. We're going out and trying to share, build friendships with people. And we're just not seeing the results that we saw in Nepal and the results that that we dream for, the fruit that, that we've hoped for. And at that point, this phrase came into my mind and it wasn't from God. Um, but it was a phrase that plagued me for a long time. And it was this phrase, you're just a little league team trying to win the World Series. Hmm. Little League is an American um, baseball. Uh, a little league team is what the kids play, you know, and I had been on a little league team. I'd played second base in Ghana. Hmm. A bunch of American dads got together and <laughs> created this little league team. And you know, these little league kids, they they try to hit the ball and they miss most of the time and they run past the bases and trip when, you know, it's <laughs> it's just this team of bumbling, stumbling kids that are trying but are not succeeding very well. And the World Series is like the World Cup in soccer, or, you know, it just that's like the highest of high, mm. you know, achievements. And I felt like aiming, and we were aiming for a church planning movement, a disciple making movement, was like trying to win the World Series. And here we were, this bumbling, stumbling, <laughs> couldn't get our act together, a group of people who had brokenness in our lives, had issues. We sometimes didn't get along with each other. There was all kinds of things going on. And I just had this phrase, you know, that plagued me for a number of weeks. And during that time, I I just felt like I need to read the Gospels and the Book of Acts again. And so I just dove into Scripture and just read again and again the Gospels and the Book of Acts, particularly the Book of Acts. And As I did that, God began to really change me inside. I want to mention an event we've got coming up in the UK on Saturday the 18th of November. It's our Frontiers Neighbours and Nations Day Conference in Oxford, where we'll be gathering to worship, to pray and to connect with you, our friends and supporters. There'll be seminars to encourage and equip you, time for you to meet workers from the field and those preparing to go, a free lunch and even a live Raw Mission podcast where you can be in the audience. Reserve your place on our website or email booking at frontiers.org.uk. Hope we can see you there. And now let's get back to the podcast. At that point, I was like 
I don't know if it's even right to ask people to aim at disciple making movements because, you know, if I'm telling them that's what we're aiming at and it's absolutely unachievable for people like us, that's not good leadership. You know, I'm setting them up for failure. I had really been struggling with this, you know, but Mm. as I poured through the book of Acts and I looked at the gospels, I studied, I, I had this faith rise in my heart that, No, (laughs) in the scripture, we see God uses absolutely ordinary people who have areas of brokenness. They're bumbling, stumbling, little league team type people. (laughs) And God used them to turn the world upside down and to bring this dramatic change in history. And if God could do it through them, faith rose in my heart. He can do this through us. And I will not let go of the dream of multiplication because the need demands it. Jesus commanded that we make disciples and train them to make more disciples. And I, at that time, it was like a a real turning point. And I've never gone back to, to questioning whether or not we should pursue multiplication, sometimes more fruitfully than others. But Mm. I knew that it's possible and that it's what God wants to do. And I could not let go of that dream. So that was a real, real turning point. And then for several years, even though my heart had shifted, we still only saw a handful. You know, we saw a few churches, we saw some second ger- generation, which is when a house church multiplies, we call it second generation. Um, and that house church starts another house church, but we weren't seeing rapidly, exponentially multiplying, you know, disciples mm-hmm. at that time. And then God led us through a process, uh, myself and some other of the youth with mission leaders, where we began to, we we actually had an organizational consultant who was working with us, and we began to look at our beliefs and our mindsets about certain things, certain things we said we believe, but our practices didn't actually reflect those beliefs. And it was in this process that God began to bring repentance and so much change in my life and in the life of other YWAM leaders at the time. And um, it was that process that really shifted things for us. And within three to four years, we saw the release of 19 new movements uh, take place. Um, And I really, it was that shift of mindset um, and belief that really brought that about, which is part of what inspired me to write this book. I really want other people to know what those were and how they can go through a similar process. Wow. Okay. That's, that's amazing. Not just 19 churches, but 19 movements. Gosh, Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, let's, let's dig into some of those. What, what were some of the elements of wrong thinking that you had that needed to be challenged or repented of? And, and how did that turn around then? Yeah. Well, one of them that I talk about in the book is open. And this is the harvest was ripe in Jesus day and it's ripe now to where Mm -hmm. I am, you know? And I think I had, I had not always experienced that. And so I was basing my beliefs, my mindset on my past experience, rather than basing it on what Jesus said is true. And so instead of sharing the gospel with people around me, I had an assumption, a wrong assumption that people didn't want to talk about God or people weren't interested in the gospel. I remember when we were in Nepal, I talked to a missionary who had worked for many years among Tibetans and they said, you know, In order for a Tibetan to come to Christ, you have to share the gospel at least seven times. They have to hear the gospel seven times before they're going to receive Christ. And, you know, that that mindset doesn't lead us to want to share the gospel. Mm. (laughs) You know, it's like, oh, this is hard. These people are so resistant. And, oh, maybe I should just pray. And I don't know if it's even worth, you know, talking to them because they're not going to want to hear it. And so that mindset shift was really an important key one. And we started to just look at scripture. Jesus said, the harvest is right. The laborers are few that we're supposed to pray Mm. for more laborers. And he told us, don't look, you know, look to the fields they are ripe for harvest. And we were looking at the fields and not seeing that. So he had to open our eyes to see that Mm. there are so many people around us. And um, I know we mentioned briefly earlier on the show that, There are people who have had visions, who have had dreams, but we can't find those people if we never 
enter into conversations, spiritual conversations with people or begin to explore, maybe there's somebody across the street from you who God has been preparing. They're just waiting for somebody, you know, to open that conversation. So we shifted our mindset to an open mindset Mm. that God has people out there who are ready to hear. That was a really key one for me. That's very helpful because it is easy to start blaming the fields around you, isn't it? And say, ah, these guys are so unresponsive. Maybe if I was somewhere else, there'd be a more responsive people group or, well, yeah, we're just here. We're here to, I mean, in some ways, yeah, you can assess the land where you live in and you work out, okay, maybe this is the time to clear some rocks, to sow some seeds, but you Mm -hmm. can still do that with faith. And Mm -hmm. we don't, if we're starting to put a timetable on God, okay, well, this will take 50 years before we see fruit. Well, where do we get that from? Just Mm. like you say, our own experiences, it's never happened here before, but no, let's, let's build our faith by looking at other places where things are happening more rapidly. It's not always a hundred years and all the missionaries are kicked out and then it starts to happen. No movements are starting Mm. to happen more quickly, aren't they now? And so Mm. we should encourage each other like today, you know, here, let's hear the stories where things started moving. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes we're, we're still clearing rocks when God's ready for us to plant, you know, but we, because we're in that rock clearing mindset and habit, Yes. We don't even plant, you know, and so yes. uh, having that that sensitivity to God and, and testing, you know, um, Jason Long said in one of the interviews I did in the research for the book, um, and he's a researcher, you know, on uh, these things around the world. He said a lot of people assume that radical Muslims are close to the gospel when the reality is many of them are open. So. Yeah, I think I'd rather err on the side of exploring to see what God might be doing than err on the side of, you know, I kept my mouth shut when there was somebody, you know, right in front of me who God was making ready for me to share with. Yeah, that's really helpful. So what are some of the other tips you'd have that you mentioned in the book? Uh, You talked about open as one of them, that that kind of trusting that the harvest is ready. What else? Mm -hmm. What are some of the other key ones that you'd like to share with us today? Yeah. Well, another one that I think a lot of people struggle with is um, a mindset that I, if I just had more of this, or if I just had more of that, I'd be able to see something released. I'd be able to multiply disciples or I'd be able to reach my community. And so there's a mindset I talk about, the mindset of enough. I don't need more stuff. I already have enough. And really shifting to a mindset that that says God has provided everything I need for life, for godliness, and for obedience to his command to make and multiply disciples in my area. Um, I know that plagued me before. I was like, oh, if I just had a better team or, oh, if I just had more anointing or if I just had more money, I could do more. Or if I just had more education or maybe I need to go to another training. Or time. Um, if I had or time. time? Yeah, we often think, oh, yeah. I don't have enough time to do all this. Yeah, exactly. If I just had more time and really realizing that God has provided everything we need, we may need to do things differently. There may need to be a mindset shift. You mentioned time. For a lot of people, that shift is shifting from thinking, I need to have this ministry time that I set aside to learning what it means to live disciple making as a part of our lifestyle. So that when we're in the market, when we're at our kids' school, when we're, you know, that we learn to incorporate disciple making into everything we do. So, you know, we may have to do things differently. Um, from what we've seen other people do as church planners or as disciple makers, or this is what outreach looks like, but actually not having everything that you think you need is, is a catalyst to do things in a different way. And it may end up being a much far more effective way. Hmm. So that's a mindset that I think is, is really helpful that I talk about in the book. Yeah, that's good. I don't know if this is a tangent from, from the different topics in your book, but I did, I did notice there was one point where you talked about church planting in America and church planting in your experience overseas in, in different faith background communities. How would you say that's different? You know, because if we're, we're talking about church planting, I mean, I, I know what you're talking about, you know, a Mm. little bit because of the, the worlds we've lived in the trainings I've gone through, but how would you 
define the differences between what most in the West think of as planting a church out of probably a bigger church um, and and what you're talking about, what you're, you were experiencing? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I had a, a conversation with a church planner here in Minnesota where I live uh, whenever we're back in the U.S., and he was he's someone who's beginning to pursue a disciple making movements approach here in the States. And he was telling me, and I, I tell the, his story in the book, he was telling me that he had successfully planted three different churches out of his denomination. He'd gone into new communities, you know, reached out to the community, made disciples, brought people in, they built a building, they, you know, they were successful in many ways. But he, when I talked to him, he said, you know what, I'm never going to do that again. I'm fed up with it. And I said, well, that's strange. You were a successful church planner in most people's eyes. You know, why would you say that? And he said, I, I can't do it again, because as soon as you build the building, as soon as you get a group of people inside that building, you shift your focus away from the lost. And you start to focus only on your programs and on your your professional, amazing platform experience that mm-hmm. you want people to come into your building to have. And, you know, I'm not trying to put down those kinds of churches, but I just, when I look at the de that's happening in the West today and so many people who are leaving the church, I, I'm concerned. I'm really worried about that model being the primary model of church planting and of the church today. And I feel like a shift back to putting discipleship at the center of all we do and really fulfilling Mm -hmm. Jesus' commission to reach the lost, to make disciples among those who don't know him. And many of those people won't even ever want to come into a church building. So how can we start groups of disciples in places and spaces that they are Mm -hmm. more comfortable to come into And I think a lot of the lessons we've been learning in places like Nepal and India are very relevant to the context that we're in right now in the West, in the UK, in Mm. the US, in Canada. And there's a lot of lessons we might have to adapt things a little bit, but there's a lot of things we've been learning in disciple making movements and church planning movements that are very relevant to the US context right now. And I think Mm. um, there's an opportunity to learn. That's interesting. And I think you referenced the Jesus movement, don't you? Because there's been a film, a Hollywood film, is it, about that recently? And and that's similar, isn't it? Because a movement to Christ started outside the churches, it, it amongst mm-hmm. these communities, I suppose, of, of hippies and so on, young Californians and perhaps others. I don't know the history very well, forgive me. But th- there's, there is more and more talk, I think, in, in the Western church, in, in the UK here anyway, of what about church outside the walls? You know, because mm, this, this model of come in isn't working so much people don't come in anymore they've got clubs they've got societies they're busy they they don't really connect with the church so much anymore so the come model it's still great if you know perhaps around food and alpha and you know we wouldn't give up on that but there's got to be a go model that's more new testament that's always been the jesus way and and i think the Mm. theologians or missiologists would call it centripetal would be old testament and centrifugal going out is more Mm. New Testament model, and we mustn't fall into just come to us. Yeah, yeah. And kind of uh, aligned with that is another mindset that I talk about in the book, and that's a mindset of all, that all are appointed to accomplish all activities. And I think really it's, it's letting the priesthood of all believers and what that really means Mm. become reality in our churches again. And in our experience of church, that it isn't about the professionals, um, you know, who are up on the stage, but it's really the the role of, and we need pastors and leaders, but the role of a pastor and a leader is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And how do we actually get equipped? How do we equip ordinary people to to impact the people around them and train them so that they can they can make disciples. I think one of the big reasons people don't make disciples is they have no idea how to do it. Mm. They've never been trained. They've never had anyone 
tell them to do anything except invite someone to church. You know, like that's the height of what we've been yeah. aiming at. And I think there's just so much more. God is in us. His spirit lives within us and he is able to work through us. We are ministers. We are royal priests because he's in us. And we need to walk in that calling as ordinary believers where every church member becomes a disciple maker who's mm -hmm. a minister of God in their community rather than just a handful of really passionate people. Yeah. Yes, one one of the images I have sometimes used when speaking in churches is is trying to get away from this idea that that when we go to church, you know, we're going to receive, to enjoy the Lord, to have fantastic Bible teaching, to be fed, to have a great experience, maybe to connect with brothers and sisters too, but overall we're there to receive. And the image in, in, I think, a lot of people's minds is it's a little bit like a cruise ship. You know, you're on a ship, you're enjoying the experience, or maybe a yacht, and you're soaking it all up, and then you go back into normal life. Whereas mm. I think the image of the church that's more biblical is more of a, a life vessel, you know, out there, a small boat out there in choppy waters, not looking for the calm and pleasant, you know, yachting in the Caribbean type of waters, but looking for the dangerous waters, searching out those who are struggling and drowning and going on a rescue mission. And I think if, if we imagine church more like that, we'd be a little more outward looking than going in just to sort of feed and receive or be entertained. Mm. Yeah, I love that. That's a beautiful picture. And I think he does call us to to be engaged with the loss. But I think, I don't know what you find in your situation, but I find there's a lot of people where even the idea of lostness, that people around us are lost and need rescuing is, is something that people don't think about, or we're not, you know, we're not sure that that is even real. And if it is, mm. do I have any part in it? You know? So I think that's a, another mm. thing where God needs to really, help us to see people. And I talk about that in the first section of the book, getting God's perspective on ourselves, mm. how we, how we view God, how we view ourselves, And the second section, how we view others. And um, if we, you know, if we can get his eyes to see that they need something that I have, <laughs> I really have something that's life giving to offer them. I do have that life vest to throw over the side or that you know ring to throw to them um, it makes us more willing to engage in those conversations but um that mindset has to be there that i have something that they really need no that's good yeah in the west certainly or the overdeveloped world perhaps we have got overfed fat and bored um we think we're fine we're cocooned away from suffering quite often we we make our little castles and our little homes we have our church bubbles. And if we're not engaging with brokenness, obviously, on a day to day, I mean, we all know the wealthiest people and the most educated in the world are as broken as anyone else, but mm. we hide it very well in our circles. I think that's what I'm trying to say. And if we're hiding the brokenness well in community and day to day jobs and professions, and even in church, if we're not being honest about our brokenness, then we've got to put ourselves into situations like Jesus did, where people were very obviously broken, hurting, and lost. And that wasn't a question. And he could then, you know, meet those needs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a danger for us, isn't it? Just to sort of isolate mm -hmm. ourselves or, or that mindset, like you say, that uh, are people really that lost? They seem okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then the reverse of that's also true of I'm too broken. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to offer. You know, as we know our own brokenness. And again, I, you know, realizing that you don't have to have your act together for God to flow through you. You just have to give away that one little thing you have, mm -hmm. you know, that that God has done for you. Can you give it away? Can you offer it as, you know, breadcrumbs to someone else? And so I think both, you know, both are true in our mindset. So that's, that's uh, really good. Another thing in your book you talk about is the difference between a convert and a disciple. Could you explain that and, and how you, you know, came to that understanding? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, I think um, a lot of times we think of a convert as someone who prays a sinner's prayer, someone who raises their hand in a service, someone who signs a commitment card, maybe. Um, depends on the context how those converts are made. But it's someone who is is saying, 
I'm willing to become a Christian, you know, basically. Um, and, you know, we worked for many years in a Hindu context, Hindu and Muslim context. And the word conversion is actually a, a really negative term in those nations. And there are anti-conversion laws. And there's this sense of, you know, a People are making converts by offering them financial support or they're, you know, rice Christians are handing out rice to the widows and then they're getting them all to raise their hand and pray a prayer and now they're Christians, you know, and really, again, Jesus never said to make converts, he said to make disciples. I was just talking with a missions pastor in a church here in the U.S. the other day and she was telling me, you know, Cynthia, there are people who fill out those cards and I call them afterwards. That's her job in the church is to call those people. I call them and a lot of them won't even answer the phone. And it's like, wow. And yet we're, we're so excited that we had all these commitment cards, but they're not disciples. <laughs> they're not yet becoming disciples. And it's, it just falls so far short of what Jesus actually commanded us to do. It can be a starting point. And I'm not you know, saying that it doesn't matter at all when somebody raises their hand or makes that kind of a confession of faith. I think it can be a starting point. But if we stop there and think that we've fulfilled the Great Commission, we're really falling short of what Jesus intended and what he meant when he gave that commission to us. He wanted us to make disciples and then teach them to obey what he had mm -hmm. commanded. So the, the role in disciple making of actually training people to follow him um, is really what Jesus is talking about. But and I, I don't know, somehow we've become very focused on um, that sinner's prayer. And again, I, mm -hmm. I think it can be a tool. But I think that's not the end goal. The end goal is to help someone begin to actually follow Christ. Yeah, definitely. There was an earlier episode I did where one of our workers, who, yeah, similar to you, been out for decades, actually. And they'd seen quite a bit of fruit. I think at one point, perhaps a thousand believers even. Um, but in hindsight, he thinks probably they were converts and he would do everything differently right now. Um, mm -hmm. as he's learned more about disciple making movements, I think he feels, yes, they trusted in Jesus for salvation. They saw that he's unique and so on, but they weren't impacting their communities. They weren't obeying Jesus, reading the scriptures to, to bring transformation. Yeah. In their families and passing it on to others, sharing the good news with others. So it just felt like it was static. They, they'd made a decision on mm -hmm. their own, but churches weren't really planted communities weren't really transformed. So that's mm -hmm. what you're talking about, isn't it? And and DMM or any other kind of discipleship making movement um, scheme, perhaps T for T or something, they're, they're all trying to sow the DNA of discipleship, obedience, sharing at a very early stage. M maybe you could talk about that and even talk about what this pre-discipleship is that will be new to a lot yeah. of our listeners. Yeah, so one of the mindsets that I talk about the, in the book is grow, grow the gospel through pre and new believers. And it's, again, not relying on professionals or really mature believers to be the ones that, that bring people to faith, but actually growing the gospel through those who are just beginning to explore faith or those who are brand new to their faith and how that is often far more fruitful and effective because they're right in the middle of relationships with all kinds of people who don't know Jesus. Um, and they're not in a little Christian bubble, you know, they're able to influence um, many through what they're sharing. And in the book, I tell the story of a lady named Gauri. Uh, she was a Hindu um, community leader in one of the slum communities where we were working. And I would go to her house each day and I, I found her because we were doing a needs assessment, uh, needs and assets assessment in the community of, you know, what does this community need? And we were doing some development work and got to know Gori. She was a, became a wonderful friend. And I would go and tell Bible stories to Gori and she would listen to the story. And then I would ask her to repeat the story back to me. And her, obviously her bangla was way better than mine. <laughs> so she would tell the story with, she was a wonderful storyteller. She would tell it so much better than I would. And then somebody would come in to ask her for something because people were always streaming in and out of her house in the midst of our storying time. 
and uh, and someone would come in and she'd say, hey, sit down, let me tell you this story. And she would repeat the story and she was telling Bible stories to her neighbors while she still had, you know, Hindu gods up on her walls. And mm. she hadn't made a full commitment to Jesus. She was a pre-believer, you know, but she was a gospel spreader. She was gossiping the gospel, you know, to the people around her. And some of those people came to know the Lord and they put their faith and trust in Jesus because of Gory sharing the gospel with them. And of course we would follow up, but um, you know, Gory actually never came to full faith where she completely shifted to a, uh, a decision to leave all of her idols and worship Jesus. But she was somebody that God used mm -hmm. as a gospel spreader. And we see the same in the new Testament. We see examples of people. Um, even the Samaritan woman is an example I talk about in the book where she she had a lot of questions still and she goes back to her community. Could this man be the Messiah? Mm. You know, she's not yet really fully put her trust in Jesus, but she brought the whole community yes. to come and hear. And um, I think, you know, we underestimate what God can do through mm. free believers and through new believers. And we put all of our, you know, hope on people like you and I, <laughs> you know, we're professionals, we've been doing this and, and very trained, but often those people are, are very effective in drawing others to faith. Yeah, brilliant. That's, that's a helpful mindset. Uh, I love the anecdotal stories of yeah you know, some of the ladies you came across and we'll ask you, yeah, you know, maybe for a few more of those in a minute. Um, a few challenges, perhaps some people struggle with this idea of rapidly growing movements to Christ. And the, the challenge would be, this is shallow. There's no one looking out for this. The theology could be, you know, warped at some point and who would know? Um, what would be some of your replies to those challenges? Yeah, well, I certainly wouldn't disagree that there are challenges. I think that would be naive to say that there's no challenges involved. Uh, when you have rapid multiplication, um, there's going to be some level of messiness in the midst of it. And um, I think we have to be honest about that and expect that that can be true. Um, but at the same time, there's also a lot that's genuine about it. You you mentioned earlier the Jesus revolution. And uh in any kind of revival, in any kind of movement, there's going to be some excesses. There's going to be some things that are messy. Um, and certainly they are, they are there in movements. But there's a lot that God is doing that's real. And when it comes to the doctrinal things and theological things, I think my experience, and I can say this with great confidence, is that those who go through Discovery Bible studies and they repeat the stories or the passage back, and they share it with others, they know the Bible better. <laughs> I can say this with real confidence. They know the Bible better than those who only listen to sermons mm. and never talk about it with anybody and have a very private faith. I've seen over and over again, and we've tested this in some really illiterate slum communities, their Bible knowledge after studying the Bible week after week, learning those stories, passing them on to others, their Bible knowledge is very, very high. And um, they may not be able to tell you what a certain theological concept, you know, is because they haven't studied theology, but they've studied scripture and it's become a part of them. They've passed it on to others. So mm. my experience has been that the theological depth that we see in movements is significantly higher than what you see in a, a church where people just come and listen. Mm, yeah. I suppose the danger in the West is we judge mature discipleship by an extensive knowledge. And mm. actually we should judge mature discipleship on character change and just yeah obedience love for Christ, obedience love for others exactly <laughs> that's the word it's obedience it's not always a comfortable word in the west but actually obeying jesus and if these guys mm -hmm. are not just oh come to jesus bring someone else to jesus and rapid movement in that way but if they equally every time they study scripture they're asking that question if this is god's word what should i do about it you know what's god asking me to do today from this passage of his word that's depth I mean, that, that isn't just breadth. It's not just a mile wide and centimeter deep. If you're 
planting obedience into these new communities early on, then you could end up with, you know, a greater maturity of discipleship than, yeah, than we're experiencing in the West, where we're just actually filling our heads with more and more and more knowledge, but we don't really change or do anything back in the week. Yeah, yeah that's so true. And the in these disciple making movements, and I in the appendix, I talk about the three part meeting and how to go about doing that. But because you have this what we call a friendly accountability cycle in disciple making, there has to be some kind of willingness to say, I'm willing to have you guys ask me if I did what I said I was going to do. And it helps me grow. I know when I have that in my life, I grow more, I'm more transformed. And so uh, we're not just studying scripture and knowing about it, but we're willing to be asked the next time we meet, did I do it? How did I do it doing it? And we're not scolding people or putting people down or making them feel uncomfortable if they didn't. But that encouragement, that, okay, next week, let's do better. We can do this together. Mm. And uh, that actually leads to much greater depth, as you said, and also transformation in their lives. It's been very transformational for me as I've participated in these groups. Mm. I suppose that leads to the question, you know, what have you seen in in the communities where these churches are multiplying? You know, are, are there stories, even anecdotal, small stories you could share of how you know, this village, there was a lot of that happening. And and actually, as the gospel came in and people started obeying, their lives and families were transformed and changed. Yeah, well, one that I love to share um, took place in South India. And there was a, a church planner, who was a YWAMer, who went into a new area and he began just walking and praying in his community. And then he met a family and uh, they had a, a daughter who was very sick. And so he and his wife shared about Jesus with this family, asked if they could pray for the daughter, prayed for her. She was touched and um, instantly a uh, miraculous kind of transformation in her physical body. And so then this family came to believe and through them, other families started to come and and this group started, they trained them how to train others. It began to multiply and spread. And sex trafficking had been really prevalent in that area. A lot of the families were selling their children because of destitution and poverty into trafficking situations, sometimes knowingly, sometimes not knowing what they were doing, offering jobs. But these traffickers, and some of them were sex, some of them were child labor traffickers as well. Uh, it was really, really common in that area. But as people began to know Jesus, uh, they began to understand the value of their children and that these kids could become someone and that God loved them. They were made in the image of God and who they were. And things began to shift and change. And they stopped sending their kids to these traffickers. And the traffickers actually came to the church planner and threatened him. And, you know, he had to make himself scarce from the area for a while, but mm. the, it was a huge turnaround in the trafficking that happened in this area because of the movement that grew there. And so um, that social transformation can be very much connected when the gospel really grips people's hearts and starts to change them. Mm. Oh, thank you. That's a very powerful story. Uh, and again, very topical in terms of what's out there in, in the film world these days with the story about yeah trafficked kids around the world and the the christian guy who was really involved god using him to to stop a lot of that trafficking brilliant this has been uh so encouraging cynthia thank you and the time is flying by i don't really want to stop talking but you've given us a brilliant hint of some of the themes in your book and i know there are many others so we'll put the details of your book in the the show notes for sure anything else that you'd like to leave us with any tips for disciple makers or I don't know uh, yeah anything favorite scriptures favorite stories you'd like to leave us with yeah well I would encourage people to get the book and it's available at www.multipliersmindset.com um, but as as far as tips I would just say one of my life messages is that God delights in using ordinary people to do extraordinary things and you may look at yourself and feel like you are ordinary and wonder if God could ever do anything amazing through your life as far as multiplying disciples or bringing community transformation, like the story I just talked about. 
Um, but I would just say, you know, just say yes to God. Just keep saying yes. And maybe yes for you is praying a prayer for your neighbor today. Mm-hmm. Or maybe yes for you is being willing to open up a conversation and share a little bit about what Jesus means to you. Or maybe yes to you is going to an unreached people group across the seas, but just keep saying yes to God. Mm -hmm. And as you say yes to him each and every day, he's going to meet you there and he's going to begin to release his power and his anointing through you. And he will do exceeding abundantly beyond all you can ask or hope for. And uh, one of the stories I tell about in the book, and you'll have to get the book to read it, but it's about this Nepali farmer um, and just how God God wants us to ask him for great things. He wants us to believe that he can do great things through us. So grab the book and read that story. I know it's going to really encourage you. I wish we had more time, but maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, praise God. Um, It is really encouraging. Thank you for sharing these stories with us. I, I, I love your heart. And we've touched on quite a few of the key elements of disciple making movements. We'll encourage people to get the book. And yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll cross paths again. God bless you and all that you're doing uh, in your current work. Great. And, and a final shout out again for the discipleship training school that YWAM put on. Do look that up. Um, YWAM bases all around the world put those on and they're brilliant for a gap year or just a break in your professional career. Yeah. So God bless you guys. Thank you so much. It was a joy to meet you and to be here on your show as well. Great. Bye-bye. Thanks for being with us today, guys. As we close, I want to offer you a gift. It's a beautiful invitation to come and join in with the mission of God, the transformational, life-giving gospel work that he has set before us. The Lord asks in Isaiah, Who will go? Whom shall I send? Could it be you? Might you be willing to lay it all down, to give up everything for the one who gave up everything for you? To join one of our teams in Central Asia, the Gulf, Africa, Asia, the Balkans, or the Caucasus? or to support some of our work through prayer and finances. If your heart is stirred to respond, do reach out to us. You can contact me on matt at frontiers.org.uk or visit our website, frontiers.org.uk or you can check out our social media platforms at Frontiers UK. God bless, guys, and do join us next time for some more inspirational and challenging stories.